It's a joy to be with all of you today, despite the storm <laughs> outside. It's just wonderful to be gathered together and to be just in the company of, of, of beloved and of God's people. And why don't, if I'd ask if we just could begin with a word of prayer together before I begin this, this service. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts always be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When I was attending seminary, I was given lots of advice. Thankfully, I listened to some of it, or most of it. But one piece of advice that I received on several of occasions was this, that often when not only our hearers, but those of us who are preaching, hear a story over and over again, we have a tendency to not listen to it carefully. And this, I think, can apply to the parables that we've heard since our childhood. So in today's gospel reading, a crowd surrounds Rabbi Jesus on all sides. And given the number of people present, Jesus opts to teach a ways back. He sits in a boat offset from the shoreline. So the crowd presses in further. What will the master speak about today? And as done on other occasions, Jesus used the methodology of the parable. A parable is an illustrative teaching tool, but at the same time, a parable can be ambiguous. Think of a parable of the parable of the Good Samaritan or the prodigal son. They're beloved, but at Jesus' time and to Jesus' hearers, they were disconcerting because Jesus, by telling them, was challenging conventional norms. Knowing that most of his hearers would be working the fields to grow grain and other crops, Jesus' use of the words sower and seeds would have resonated with this crowd. Yet this sower, this sower in Jesus' parable, tossed, seemingly carelessly tossed, precious seed about, not concerned if it landed on good soil, thorn-infested rock, solid rock, so to people who were in the throes of poverty, to many who were peasants in his audience, his words must have really sounded not just ambiguous, but even offensive. Given how indiscriminate this sower was, when it came to sowing precious seeds, can you imagine the reaction of his hearers when they heard this. We can almost hear one peasant farmer saying to another, only a spendthrift would cast around seeds like that. Yet what if the seeds, what if the seeds cast off by that spendthrift in Jesus' parable aren't mere seeds? What if the seeds Jesus spoke of symbolize God's mercy? The kind of mercy extended to the deserving, the good soil, and the undeserving, the rocky, parched, and hardened soil. I found when I pondered this parable I was afforded the opportunity to hear of a great story, a centuries-old story that resonates with today's passage, and it's told by the Huna Tlingit. They're a Pacific Northwest tribe in, of Alaska, and it explains their flight from Glacier Bay centuries ago. And at the center of this story, is a young adolescent Clinkit woman who lived in the early 17th century. And she lived along with her family and others 
on Glacier Bay. Now in the Clinket tradition, it's important for us to understand the makeup of families is matrilineal from a mother to her children. So while men may have been conferred the role of leadership or shaman within the tribe, women held then and still hold significant clout within their kinship circles. During Castine's time, when young adolescent women were going through puberty, they relocated to the outskirts of the village because the tribe afforded such women in transition significant power. However, one day, and while she was in isolation, Castine, a mere adolescent, grew bored. She was tired of being separated from everyone else, and so in a fit of adolescent irritation, she stepped outside of her hut and holding a chunk of raw salmon, taunted an enormous glacier that would have summoned, like she did, she would summon a dog. She held out the, the salmon and she taunted the glacier saying, here glacier, here glacier, come and get it, come and get it. Now, while we moderns may not think too much of this story, or what Castine did is significant. For the indigenous people of that period and now then, lakes and oceans and mountains and glaciers possess a spiritual dimension. In Castine's day and even now, to speak disrespectfully to the natural world is taboo. And it has the potential of precipitating dire consequences. Because following Castine's capricious actions, it is told that the glacier began to advance quickly. Ultimately, it destroyed the entire village. It had all the makings of an ecological disaster for the indigenous people. And in the face of this rapidly advancing glacier, the tribe had to quickly gather what they could and flee their beloved native home. However, in the indigenous tradition, someone had to pay the price of violating these natural and spiritual forces. Someone would have to stay and accept responsibility for what had been done. When the story was told to us, we heard of two endings. In the first one, Castine had to ultimately pay for her actions. She had to remain, which meant, of course, certain death. However, there is another ending to this story. Wanting her granddaughter to survive and have children of her own one day, Castine's aged grandmother, Tsaiwat Sik, stepped forward to take place of her young granddaughter so that she could escape with the others. Could you forward this, please? And again. This is a rendering of what Castine's village would have looked like during that time. And as you can see, there is a large glacier in the background. But as the glacier advanced, it meant a certain demise of the village itself. Yet the aged woman, when she stepped forward to take her granddaughter's place, she didn't only step forward to preserve her granddaughter's life. She had something else in mind. She knew that by fleeing with the others from this beloved village, and having to resettle in a less attractive and less fertile place. The villagers and her tribe would have to do the hard work of forgiveness. They would have to forgive Castine for her capricious actions. But even more important, her granddaughter would need to atone for her recklessness by helping the tribe adapt to their new home as best as they could. 
Go ahead. Let's read one more. Thank you. The power of this story is that God's forgiveness and mercy are seldom offered on our terms. Like the sower in Jesus' parable, mercy and forgiveness are not just directed to the good soil, the good soil of our lives, but particularly to those areas of our lives that are gnarly, that are thorny, that are hardened, the hardened, unattractive aspects of us, such as places in our lives where we know not what we do, but the long-term implications of our action or inaction when we know not what we do has dire consequences, not only for ourselves, but particularly for those whom Jesus calls our neighbor. Earlier, I spoke of the word atonement when speaking of the difficult task that was given the young clinket woman, Kashin. You know, consider that as a teenager, most likely, she wasn't thinking about long-term consequences when she broke the taboo. She was just acting annoyed. But for our Jewish siblings, the days of awe between Rosh Hashanah culminating in Yom Kippur enacts the necessary work of making amends for one's transgressions so as to seek reconciliation with God applies for every single one. So in the Christian tradition, when we recall Jesus' words from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Was Jesus only referring to those who were clueless, who were unaware of what they were doing? Or as suggested by Juan, consider that for people for the most part may be aware of what they're doing at the time. They're aware of it. But the catch is, at times, we don't think about the long-term implications of our behavior, of our actions, or our failure to act. Instead, it's been recommended that we focus on the first part of Jesus' words, where he says, begins with, Father, forgive them. Weeks passed, Barry and I gazed upon the beauty of the Alaskan wilderness. We marveled at its glory and its wonder and its sheer size. It was just amazing. But I also pondered the story of Kashin. And I can appreciate that why in the Clinket Nation it is told and retold generation after generation, because in lamenting the loss of the permafrost, in lamenting the pollution of the waters and the loss of wildlife, the Clinket people find both solace but also renewed purpose in this story. As Jesus' parable teaches us, we don't always fully understand the consequences of our behavior, our actions, or our inactions. Nevertheless, the potentiality for a changed heart remains, offered by the one whose forgiveness and mercy knows no end, and who summons all of us, each and every one of us, to do nothing less than the work of repairing the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.